Section 11. The Cost of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The cost in casualties could not be considered heavy in view of the success gained. Extract from Official Dispatch. In the outside there were blazing sunshine and heat, a haze of smoke and dust, a nostril-stinging reek of cordite and explosive, and a never-ceasing tumult of noises. Inside was gloom, but a closer, heavier heat, a drug-shop smell, and all the noises of outside little subdued and mingled with other lesser but closer sounds. Outside a bitterly fought trench battle was raging. Here, inside, the wreckage of battle was being swiftly but skillfully sorted out, classified, bound up, and dispatched again into the outer world. For this was one of the field dressing stations, scattered behind the fringe of the fighting line, and through one or other of these were passing the casualties as quickly as they could be collected and brought back. The station had been a field laborer's cottage, and had been roughly adapted to its present use. The interior was in semi-darkness, because the windows were completely blocked up with sandbags. The door, which faced toward the enemy's lines, was also sandbagged up, and a new door had been made by knocking out an opening through the mud-brick wall. There were two rooms connected by a door, enlarged again by the tearing down of the lath and plaster partition. The only light in the inner room filtered through the broken and displaced tiles of the roof. On the floor, laid out in rows so close-packed that there was barely room for an orderly to move, were queer, shapeless bundles that at first glance could hardly be recognized as men. They lay huddled on blankets or on the bare floor in dim shadowy lines that were splashed along their length with irregularly placed gleaming white patches. They were puzzling, these patches, shining like snow left in the hollows of a mountain seen far off and in the dark. A closer look revealed them as the bandages of the first field dressing that every man carries stitched in his uniform, against the day he or the stretcher-bearers may rip open the packet to use it. A few of the men moved restlessly, but most lay very still. A few talked, and one or two even laughed and another moaned slowly and at even unbroken intervals. Two or three lighted cigarettes pinpricked the gloom in specks of orange light that rose and fell, glowing and sparkling and lighting a faint outline of nose and lip and cheeks, sinking again to dull red. A voice called feebly at first, and then as no one answered more strongly and insistently for water. When at last it was brought, every other man there demanded or pleaded for a drink. In the outer room, a clean-edged circle of light blazed in the center from an acetylene lamp, leaving the walls and corners in a shadow deep by contrast to blackness. Half the length of a rough deal table jutted out of the darkness into the circle of light, and beneath it its black shadow lay solid halfway across the light ring on the floor and into this light passed a constant procession of wounded, some halting for no more than the brief seconds necessary for a glance at the placing of a bandage and an injection of an anti-tetanus serum, some waiting for long pain-laden minutes while a bandage was stripped off, an examination made, in certain cases a rapid play made with cruel-looking scissors and knives. Sometimes a man would walk to the table, and stoop a bandaged head or thrust a bandaged hand or arm into the light. Or a stretcher would appear from the darkness and be laid under the light, while the doctor's hands busied themselves about the khaki form that lay there. Some of the wounds were slight, some were awful and unpleasant, beyond telling. The doctors worked in a high pressure of haste, but the procession never halted for an instant. One patient was hardly clear of the light circle before another appeared in it. There were two doctors there, one a young man with a lieutenant's stars on his sleeve, the other apparently a man of about uh, thirty, in bare arms with rolled-up shirt-sleeves. His jacket, hooked on the back of a broken chair, bore the badges of a captain's rank. The faces of both, 
as they caught the light, were pale and glistening with sweat. The hands of both, as they flitted and darted about bandages or torn flesh, were swift-moving, but steady and unshaking as steel pieces of machinery. Words that passed between the two were brief to curtness, technical to the last syllable. About them the dust motes danced in the light, the air hung heavy and stagnant, smelling of chemicals, the thick, sickly scent of blood, the sharper reek of sweat, and everything about them, the roof over their heads, the walls around, the table under their hands, the floor beneath their feet, shook and trembled and quivered without cessation. And also, without pause, the uproar of battle bellowed and shrieked and pounded in their ears. Shells were streaming overhead, the closer ones with a rush and a whoop, the higher and heavier ones with long whistling sighs and screams. Shells exploding near them crashed thunderously and set the whole building rocking more violently than ever. The rifle and machine-gun fire never ceased, but rose and fell, sinking at times to a rapid spluttering crackle, rising again to a booming drum-like roll. The banging reports of bombs and grenades punctuated sharply the running roar of gun and rifle fire. Through all the whirlwind of noise the doctors worked steadily. Unheeding the noise, the dust, the heat, the trembling of the crazy building, they worked from dawn to noon, and from noon on again to dusk, only pausing for a few minutes at midday to swallow beef tea and a biscuit, and in the afternoon to drink tepid tea. Early in the afternoon a light shell struck a corner of the roof, making a clean hole on entry and blowing out the other side in a clattering gust of flame and smoke, broken tiles and splintering wood. The room filled with choking smoke and dust and bitter, blinding fumes, and a shower of dirt and fragments rained down on the floor and table, on the doctors and on the men lying round the walls. At the first crash and clatter some of the wounded cried out sharply, but one amongst them chided the others, asking had they never heard a fizz-bang before, and what would the doctor be thinking of them squealing there like a lot of schoolgirls at a mouse in the room? But later in the day there was a worse outcry, and a worse reason for it. The second room was being emptied, the wounded being carried out to the ambulances that awaited them close by outside. There came suddenly out of the surrounding din of battle four quick, ear-filling rushes of sound. Sh-sh-sh-sh-sh! Sh -sh 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 bang The shells had passed over no more than clear of the cottage, and burst in the air just beyond and for an instant the stretcher-bearers halted hesitatingly, and the wounded shrank on their stretchers. But next instant the work was resumed, and was in full swing when a minute later there came again the four wind rushes, followed this time by four shattering crashes, an appalling clatter of whirling tiles and brickwork. The cottage disappeared in swirling clouds of smoke and brick dust, and out of the turmoil came shrieks and cries and groans. When the dust had cleared it showed one end of the cottage completely wrecked, the roof gone, the walls gaping in ragged rents, the end wall collapsed in jumbled ruins. Inside the room was no more than a shambles. There were twenty-odd men in it when the shells struck. Seven were carried out alive, and four of these died in the moving. In the other room where the two doctors worked, no damage was done beyond the breakdown of a portion of the partition wall, and there was only one further casualty. A man who was actually having a slight hand wound examined at the moment. He was killed instantly by a shell fragment which whizzed through the doorway. The two doctors, after a first hasty examination of the new casualties, held a hurried consultation. The obvious thing to do was to move, but the question was... Where to? One place after another was suggested, only for the suggestion to be dismissed for some good and adequate reason. In the middle of the discussion, a fresh torrent of casualties began to pour in. Some plainly required immediate attention, and the doctors fell to work again. By the time the rush was cleared, the question of changing position had been forgotten, or at any rate was dropped. The wounded continued to arrive, and the doctors 
continued to work. By now, late afternoon, the fortunes of the fight were plainly turning in favour of the British. It was extraordinary the difference it made in the whole atmosphere. To the doctors, the orderlies, the stretcher-bearers, and even, or rather most of all, to the wounded who were coming in. In the morning the British attack had been stubbornly withstood, and thousands of men had fallen in the first rushes to gain a footing in the trenches opposite. The wounded who were first brought in were the men who had fallen in these rushes, in the forward trench, in the communication trenches on their way up from the support trench, and from the shell-fire on the support trenches, because they themselves had made no advance, or had seen no advance made, they believed the attack was a failure, that thousands of men had fallen and no ground had been gained. The stretcher-bearers who brought them in had a similar tale to tell, and everyone looked glum and pulled a long face. About noon, although the advance on that particular portion was still hung up, a report ran that success had been attained elsewhere along the line. In the early afternoon, the guns behind burst out in a fresh paroxysm of fury, and the shells poured streaming overhead and drenched the enemy trenches ahead with a new and greater deluge of fire. The rifle fire and the bursting reports of bombs swelled suddenly to the fullest note yet attained. All these things were hardly noted, or at most were heeded with a half-attention back in the dressing station, but it was not long before the fruits of the renewed activity began to filter and then to flood back to the doctor's hands. But now a new and more encouraging tale came with them. We were winning. We were advancing. We were into their trenches all along the line. The casualties bore their wounds to the station with absolute cheerfulness. This one had got it in the second line of trenches. This one had seen the attack launched on the third trench. Another had heard we had taken the third in our stride and were pushing on hard. The regiment had had a hammering, but they were going good. The battalion had lost the O.C. and a heap of officers, but they were in with a bayonet at last. So the story ran for two full hours. It was borne back by men with limbs and bodies hacked and broken and battered, but with lips smiling and babbling words of triumph. There were some who would never walk, would never stand upright again, who had nothing before them but the grim life of a helpless cripple. There were others who could hardly hope to see the morrow's sun rise, and others again, grey-faced with pain and with white-knuckled hands clenched to the stretcher edges but all slightly wounded or serious or dangerous seemed to have forgotten their own bitter lot, to have no thought but to bear back the good word that we're winning. Late in the afternoon the weary doctors sensed a slackening in the flowing tide of casualties. They were still coming in, being attended to and passed out in a steady stream, but somehow there seemed less rush, less urgency, less haste on the part of the bearers to be back for a fresh load. And, ominous sign, there were many more of the bearers themselves coming back as casualties. The reason for these things took little finding. The fighting line was now well advanced, and every yard of advance meant additional time and risk in the bearing back of the wounded. One of the regimental stretcher-bearers put the facts bluntly, and briefly to the doctors. The open ground in a communication trenches is fair I mean, with shells and bullets. We're just about losing two bearers for every one casualty we bring out. Now we're leaving them lie there snug as we can till dark. A chaplain came in and asked permission to stay there. One of my regiments has gone up, he said, and they'll bring the casualties in here. I won't get in your way. I may be able to help a little. Here is one of my men now. A stretcher was carried in and laid with its burden under the doctor's hands. The man was covered with wounds from head to foot. He lay still while the doctors cut the clothing off him and adjusted bandages, but just before they gave him morphia he spoke. Don't oh, let me die, doctor, he said. For Christ's sake, don't oh, let me die. Don't say I'm going to die. His eye met the chaplain's, and the grey head stooped near to the young one. 
I'm the only one left, Padre, he said. Me old mother. Don't let me die, Padre. You know how it is back home. Don't let me die, too. But the lad was past saving. He died there on the table, under their hands. God help his mother, said the chaplain softly. It was her the boy was thinking of, not himself. His father was killed yesterday. Old Jim Doherty, twenty-three years' service. Batman to the O.C. Would come out again with young Jim and Walt. Been with the regiment all his life. The regiment has taken him and his two boys and left the mother to her old age without husband or chick or child. The two doctors were lighting cigarettes and inhaling the smoke deeply with the enjoyment that comes after hours without tobacco. Another man was born in. He was grimed with dust and dirt, smeared with blood. The sweats of agony beaded his forehead. But he grinned a twisted grin at the doctors and chaplain. And here we are again, as the song goes, he said as the stretcher was laid down. This makes the third time wounded in this war twice home and out again. <laughs> but this is like to be the last trip, I'm thinking. What about it, sir? Will I be losing them both? and he looked down at his smashed legs. Ah, I thought so, he went on. I'm a market gardener, but I don't know how I'm going to market garden without legs. Four kids, too. The eldest six years and an ailing wife. But she'll have me. Oh, what's left of me? And that's more than uh, many will have. "'That'll be all right, lad,' said the chaplain. "'You'll have a pension. "'The country will look after you.' "'Ha, <laughs> ha, padre, I, I didn't see you, sir. "'The country? <laughs> "'Ask my brother Joe about the country. "'Wounded in South Africa, he was. And "'Never done a day's work since. "'And the pension has been barely enough to starve on decently.' It'll be the same again after all this is over, I don't doubt. Anyway, that's how we all feels about it. No, sir, I don't feel no great pain to speak of. Sort of numb-like below there, just. He went on talking quite rationally and composedly until he was taken away. After that there was another pause, and the ambulances, for the first time that day, were able to get the station cleared before a fresh lot came in. The dusk was closing in, but there was still no abatement of the sounds of battle. There must be crowds of men lying out in front there wanting attention, said the captain, reaching for his coat and putting it on quietly. You might stay here, Dewar, and I'll have a look out and see if there's a chance of getting forward to give a hand. The other doctor offered to go if the other would wait, but his offer was quickly put aside. I'll be back in an hour or two, the captain said and went off. Dewar and the chaplain stood in the door and watched him go. A couple of heavy shells crashed down on the parapet of the communication trench he was moving toward, and for a minute his figure was hidden by the swirling black smoke and yellow dust. But they saw him a moment later as he reached the trench, turned and waved a hand to them, and disappeared. "'His name's McGillivray,' said the doctor in answer to a question from the chaplain. One of the finest fellows I've ever met, and one of the cleverest surgeons in Great Britain. He is recognized as one of the best already, and he's only beginning. Did you notice him at work? The most perfect hands, and an eye, as quick and keen as an eagle's. He misses nothing, sees little things in a flash, where twenty men might pass them. He's a wonder. And McGillivray was moving slowly along the communication trench that led to the forward fire trench. It was a dangerous passage, because the enemy's guns had the position and range exactly and were keeping a constant fire on the trench, knowing the probability of the supports using it. In fact, the supports moving up had actually abandoned the use of the approach trenches and were hurrying across the open for the most part. McGillivray, reluctant at first to abandon the cover of the trench, was driven at last to doing so by a fact forced upon him at every step that the place was a regular shell-trap. 
Sections of it were blown to shapeless ruins. Pits and mounds of earth and the deep shell craters gaped in it and to either side for all its length. Even where the high explosive shells had not fallen, the shrapnel had swept and the clouds of flies that swarmed at every step told of the blood-soaked ground. Even where the torn fragments of limbs and bodies had not been left, as they were in many places. So McGillivray left the trench and scurried across the open with bullets hissing and buzzing about his ears and shells roaring overhead. He reached the forward fire trench at last and halted there to recover his breath. The battered trench was filled with the men who had been moved up in support, and there were many wounded amongst them. He busied himself for half an hour amongst them, and then prepared to move on across the open to what had been the enemy's front-line trench. It was dusk now, and shadowy figures could be seen coming back toward the British lines. At one point a dip in the ground in an old ditch gave some cover from the flying bullets. Toward this point along, which had been the face and was now the back of the enemy front trench, and then in along the line of the hollow, a constant procession of wounded moved slowly. It was easy to distinguish them and even to pick out in most cases where they were wounded, because in the dusk the bandages of the first field dressing showed up startlingly white and clear on the shadowy forms against the shadowy background. Some, with the white patches on heads, arms, hands, and upper bodies, were walking. Others, with the white on feet and legs, limped and hobbled painfully, leaning on the parapet or using their rifles crutch-wise and others lay on the stretchers that moved with desperate slowness toward safety. The line appeared unending. The dim figures could be seen trickling along the parapets as far as the eye could distinguish them. The white dots of the bandage were visibly moving as far along the parapet as the sight could reach. McGillivray moved out from the broken trench and hurried across the open. There were not more than fifty yards to cross, but in that narrow space the bodies lay huddled singly and heaped in little clumps. They reminded one exactly of the loafers who sprawl asleep and sunning themselves in the park on a Sunday afternoon. Only the dead lay in that narrow strip. The living had been moved or had moved themselves long since. McGillivray pushed on into the trench, along it to a communication trench and up and down one alley after another, until he reached the most advanced trench where the British held. Here a pandemonium of fighting was still in progress, but to this McGillivray, after the first couple of minutes, paid no heed. A private, with a bullet through his throat, staggered back from his loophole and collapsed in the doctor's arms, and after that McGillivray had his hands too full with casualties to concern himself with the fighting. Several dugouts had been filled with wounded, and the doctor crawled about amongst these and along the trench, applying dressings and bandages as fast as he could work, seeing the men placed on stretchers or sent back as quickly as possible toward the rear. He stayed there until a message reached him by one of the stretcher-bearers who had been back to the dressing station that he was badly needed there, and that Mr. Duar hoped he would get back soon to help them. Certainly the dressing station was having a busy time. The darkness had made it possible to get back hundreds of casualties from places whence they dare not be moved by day. They were pouring into the station through the doctor's hands. Three of them were hard at work there by this time, and out again to the ambulances as rapidly as they could be handled. Despite the open, shell-wrecked end and the broken roof, the cottage was stiflingly close and sultry. The heavy scent of blood hung sickeningly in the stagnant air, and the whole place swarmed with pestering flies. There was no time to do much for the patients. All had been more or less efficiently bandaged by the regimental stretcher-bearers who picked them up. The doctors did little more than examine the bandagings, loosening these and tightening those, making injections to ward off tetanus, performing an operation or an amputation now and again in urgent cases, sorting out occasionally a hopeless casualty where a wound was plainly mortal, and setting him aside to leave room in the ambulances for those the hospitals below might yet save. One of these mortal cases was a young lieutenant. He knew himself that there was little or no hope for him, but he smoked a cigarette and spoke with composure or simulated composure 
to the doctor and the chaplain. Hello, Padre, he said. Looks like a washout for me this time. You'll have to break it to the pater, you know. I'm afraid he'll take it rather hard, too. Rough luck, isn't it, Doc? But then... His face twitched with pain, and he covered the break in his voice by blowing a long cloud of smoke. After all, it's all in the game, you know. All in the game, the chaplain said when he had gone. A cruel game, but gallantly played out. And he's the fourth son to go in this war, and the last male of his line except his father, the old earl. A family that has made its mark on a good few history pages. And this is the end of it. You think it's quite hopeless for him, Doctor? The doctor looked up in surprise from the fresh, slightly wounded case he was overhauling. Hopeless? Why, it's not even... Oh, oh, him. Y yes, I'm afraid so. I, I wish McGillivray would come back, he went on irritably. He's worth the three of us here put together. When we have to fiddle and probe and peer, he would just look. He'd just half shut those hawk eyes of his and look. And he'd know exactly what to do and what not to do. Though that'll do, Sergeant. Take him off. Where's that bottle of mine? What's this? Hand? Bandage not hurting you? All right. Uh, pass him over there for the anti-tetanus. Now then. A burly private, with the flesh of his thigh showing clear white where the grimy khaki had been cut clear and hung flapping, limped in and pushed forward a neatly bandaged limb for inspection. I thought they did that up in the trenches, he remarked. Said to tell you he did it. And he was all right, and I only needed the anti-tempus and a ticket for home. Oh, that's McGillivray, I'll bet, said young Dewar. Where was this? I'm forth the German trench, sir, the man said cheerfully. You know, we got four, four trenches took. We're winning this time, all right. Fair like I'm going, I believe. It'll be glorious victory in the headlines tomorrow. Things like this, you know, must be, quoted the chaplain softly as another badly wounded man was brought in. I wonder what the victory is costing us. Never mind. It's uh, cost another side more, sir, said the casualty grimly and then shut lips and teeth tight on the agony that followed. I wish McGillivray would come, said Duar when that was finished. He could have done it so much better. It's just the sort of case he's at his best on. And his best is something that medical journals write columns about. I wish he'd come. And then soon after he did come. Came on a stretcher with a bandage about his head and over his eyes. McGillivray, cried the young doctor, and stood a moment staring with his jaw dropped. Yes, said McGillivray with lips tight drawn. It's me. Uh, that's Dwar, isn't it? No need to undo the bandage, Dwar. It's my eyes. Both gone. A bullet through them both. And I'll never hold a scalpel again. <laughs> you can give me some morphia, Dwar, and send me on to the ambulance out of the way. I'm no good here now, nor anywhere else. Now, or ever. I won't die, I know. But... They gave him the morphia, and before he slid off into unconsciousness, he spoke a last word to the chaplain. You were right, Padre. You remember. It's the women pay the hardest. I'm thinking of my wife. The chaplain's thoughts went back to the wife and mother of the Doherty's, to the legless market gardener and his ailing wife to the boy lieutenant who was the last of his line, and a score more he knew, and his eyes followed as the stretcher bore out the hope that had been a man who had done much to relieve pain, and might have done so much more. The voice of another new arriving casualty broke his thoughts. We're winning, doctor, it was saying exultantly. All along the line we're winning this time. The jocks has got right away forward, and the Gurkis is in with the killing knives on our left, and the Irish is in front of all. Glory be! <laughs> Tis a big fight this time, and it's winning we are. May good arms go, and I know. 
but I'd rather be here with one arm than anywhere else with two. And what's an arm or a man more or less in the world? We're winning, I tell you. We're winning! End of section 11